Well, everybody, it's been done. While the Grand Slam wasn't to be, Ireland have become the first team since 2017 to win the Six Nations Championship back to back. This wasn't necessarily one of the most entertaining games of all time, but what it was for those who are new to rugby was an absolute defensive masterclass that I think any defense coach should do a lot of digging into. Uh, my name's Max, I'm gonna be the host of today's video and congratulations to the Irish and the Scottish for making a really entertaining game for us all of you. A massive thank you to my patrons as well. Um, today's going to be a bit of a recap and analysis on how the Irish managed to win this game. Without wasting any more time for you guys, let's just get straight into this. It was always going to be a grind fest of a test and Scotland's excellent mall defence is the reason why. Let's take notice on 1201 of the fact that Scotland's don't bother to contest the line out. The forward pack all begins a rotation sync with this animation so they can fold inwards and apply pressure at the source of Ireland's push. Sheehan, who remains in his throw-in position, takes notice of the scrum-like defensive formation by Scotland calling for plan B. Although plan B is just as scary for a defensive line, Scotland hold their own. Furlong, as we can see while zooming in, binds to McCarthy before the ball is taken into contact, which allows for Christie to take the bait and wrap around. Van der Merwe, though, defends superbly and doesn't fall for the bait, as he lands a big shot on Sheehan's chest so that Christie can rotate and drive him into touch. While Scotland's survival here pretty much sums up the game, Sheehan does indeed score. In his quest to be the world's best hooker by the end of this year, he stands very close to the following lineout with Scotland wanting to kick for touch. Sheehan Sheehan's presence at the back applies pressure, Turner succumbs, overthrowing the line out and Sheehan dots the ball down indeed. Now the reason it's so easy for Sheehan comes down to how Scotland's attack is set. Christie as an alternate angle shows us is wrapping around with the intent to bind. Because Porter comes in and helps to lift O'Mahony and build pressure, Christie sees the opportunity to gain more metres to allow White the chance for a better clearance kick. Therefore, White is the only player able to tackle Sheehan. Sheehan's a hooker, White's a halfback, you guys do the math. The defence, as I said in the intro, it's just as brilliant from an Irish perspective as we now take a look at how they shut some opportunities down. Remembering Furlong's bind to McCarthy before that carry we just examined makes us really question why Skuman is taking the ball into contact here without a ruck clearance option, because he's driven in as a single man pod at the freeze frame of the Irish tackle, three other forwards are now forced into the breakdown and prevent a contest for the ball. As we now cut to the wide shot we can also see that Scotland's disorganised attack has allowed every Irish defender to set. While the triangle shown in this blue axis has potential to give Scotland several options, the static nature of a two-man pod, Russell and also Cummings, blunts the metaphorical knife severely. Cummings begins running the decoy line too late, which now on 1602 reveals a very simple hands down the line. While Russell does well to get the ball wide, Ireland simply just hold, spread, and Gibson Park cuts down Jones, allowing low to then Jacqueline slow Scottish ball. Scotland have indeed played exciting rugby, but not with as much organisation, forcing Russell to instead kick the penalty goal and close the gap to one point. The rest of the first half, as I said guys, wasn't really that entertaining for a casual viewer, but my goodness, was it putting you on the edge of your seat with Ireland leading by a 7-6 at half time. The possession stats were definitely a key reason for Ireland being able to tire the Scottish out, forcing them to make a number of tackles, and the amount of possession Ireland had, well, this is really showing at a lot of the attack stats. They're winning um, more defenders beaten, they've broken the line twice, they've made so many more passes. They've also made four offloads, but Scotland have been able to keep this position a little bit lower by winning five turnovers and that was definitely a reason that a lot of try scoring opportunities for the Irish did end up getting spoiled because Scotland and particularly Andy Christie were very very strong over the ball at the breakdown. As we can see though I continue to talk about it throughout this video and well for the rest of the duration look at the tackle stats. 91% for Scotland despite attempting 124 tackles. 
unbelievable stuff, great work ethic from the defenders. The Irish, um, pretty good as well, though we can't necessarily read into it as much as the Scottish because they did just attempt 67 tackles. The Ruck sixties as well, very, very good stuff for both teams, though the fact that Ireland were winning more Rucks with their own possession did help them to retain a lot of the possession that we mentioned in the start of this halftime stats review. Uh, the set piece as well, nothing too dreadful. Scotland just losing the one line out, which did result in Ireland's only try, and of course they did lose the one scrum. The fact that Scotland's single lost line out was the only reason Ireland had any points in the first half just goes to show how absolutely ferocious the defending was from both sides. Seriously, if opposition mistakes are the only reason points are getting scored, this is just more proof that the defensive masterclass continues to go. With both teams conceding just two penalties inside their own half as well, um, I think it's fair that's why there weren't too many kicks at goal during this first half. Great from Finn Russell to slot both of the um, opportunities that the Irish offered him as well. Very good thinking considering this was such a low scoring effort. Anyway guys, after we have this ad break we'll discuss how the second half went. Now that we begin coverage of the second half, we'd better discuss the disallowed try for Robbie Henshaw that followed a knock on by Tyke Furlong that also wasn't a try. Because the referee is standing here when Henshaw lands across the try line, the referee can't see if the ball has been grounded or not. When the referee gets low he now sees the ball held up. Because the referee hasn't seen a grounding, the camera needs to show clear evidence not only of the ball touching grass, but of the ball touching grass past the try line. As we can see here, there's clearly an arm beneath the ball on this shot, and then again here, from the angle the referee has seen it with. The only available frames that could have told us about the grounding now show Horn's knees in front of the ball. Because his knees are obstructing this process, the TMO can't see a grounding either. For those who are new to rugby, this is why the try couldn't be allowed for Henshaw. With Scotland down to 14, men after giving away successive penalties though, Ireland were about to be as inevitable as Thanos. Now what Kelleher does here is simply genius, because there's a ruck straight in front of Porter with Scotland having fell for the decoy line, the gap gets exposed. Porter now has the ability to run through either of the holes we show here, but with Van der Fleer in as a second decoy runner, Dempsey and Christie get forced to go low late, as Dempsey for a brief moment is the only player allowed to tackle Porter. Bielem and Van der Fleer show incredible strength and shove Porter over the line with the referee having seen a grounding this time. Luckily for Scotland, they do get one final chance to spoil the party. It's thanks to some utterly atrocious tackle technique by Harry Byrne, leaving Ireland's to finish the match with just 14 men. Thanks to the man advantage, Scotland get a great opportunity. Ireland have reverted back to some quick line speed on defence, as this highlight of Henshaw shows us. Because he rushes up so hard, his right shoulder is the only one to connect with Jones's torso, while his bind from the right is correct, the speed at which he tackles means he can't get low enough. Suddenly, Doris, who we can see doing his job guarding the fringes correctly beforehand, is forced to move on Jones. The fact that Dempsey is sitting here on the wide shot means Doris also has to watch Stain. Van der Fleer is also stuck in a 2 on 1 because of Henshaw's missed tackle. The fact that Scotland have an extra player means Doris has no choice but to also tackle with bad technique. As Jones is the best 13 in the world, it's relatively easy for him from here. Scotland though don't necessarily have enough will to win in comparison to the Irish having been forced to make so many tackles, Ireland are able to win by 17 to 13. Not very high scoring, not necessarily a Kiwi's cup of tea, but boy edge of your seat stuff. I don't think the Irish fans would have wanted it any other way. That have been scared about losing the Six Nations all of a sudden, only to just get that sigh of relief and realise, no it's okay, we are not about to lose test matches back to back, we are going to lift trophies back to back. The possession rate as well remained very high for Ireland with 59% to end the game, with a total territory rate of 65%. They were definitely kicking away a fair bit of ball and they were constantly pushing Scotland backwards, 
getting the ability to play a lot more rugby inside Scotland's half because they are setting up their chases in 2024 superbly. The attack structure as well started to come alive for Scotland, though they couldn't necessarily generate anything. It was nice to see them run a few more metres and as mentioned before, their breakdown work ethic did continue. They finished the game off with seven turnovers. Had Scotland won, I think it would have been fair to give Andy Christie player of the match. As we can see with the tackle success as well, well, the fact that Ireland did start to get a bit tired from running into brick walls all the time did mean they found defence so hard because they'd just got into this groove of attack, 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 carry, 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 crash the ball, crash the ball, crash the ball. It suddenly meant that defence was a little bit weird for them. It kind of brought them off their mojo not having the ball in hand. Scullin as well to attempt 200 plus tackles and finish with 91%. Guys, that's amazing stuff. Um, as well, the ruck success, 98% for both teams. This pretty much embodies why you're on the edge of your seat. Insane as well, Scotland, losing just two lineouts, one of them ending in a try. It's madness. Ireland did lose two lineouts themselves, and both teams only lost one scrum, so set piece, very strong from both teams as well. At the end of the day though, Ireland really should have won by a lot more points when you consider the fact that Scotland conceded nine penalties inside their own half. After Ireland refused to kick a lot of three pointers that were lined up against the All Blacks, I do wonder if this refusal to take the three could cause them some problems against South Africa during the mid-year tests, but I'm not going to mention South Africa for right now. A lot of South African fans have been putting the Irish down saying, oh, the Six Nations in the World Cup, who cares? Let the Irish enjoy their victory, because goodness me, do they deserve to celebrate after a hard-fought win for St. Patrick's weekend. A special mention as well to Peter O'Mahony, who has uh, hinted at his possible retirement from Test Rugby with the Six Nations now over. If Peter O'Mahony does choose to retire from here, Good on him, great to see him cross the 100 test margin and finish his career as the captain of his country, playing alongside Jack Crowley, who got his autograph as a 12 year old kid. Thank you very much for watching today's video guys, my name's Max, as I said at the start of the video. Make sure you subscribe, like the video and uh, of course share your thoughts down below in the comments because I'd love to see another perspective on how this game turned out. Thank you very much for watching the video and I'll see you next time, cheers for watching guys.